welcome, fellow Americans, to the City Tavern. A mere block from one of my proudest accomplishments, the first bank of the United States. How I came to a place where I could make such a contribution is a story perhaps worth consideration. It has very properly been ranked not among the least of the advantages which compensate for the evils that revolutions produce, but they serve to bring to light talents and virtues which might otherwise have languished in obscurity or only shot forth a few scattered and wandering ranks. What others saw as trouble and danger during a time of change, I saw as opportunity. During our war for independence, I earned the trust of General Washington himself, eventually rising to the rank of colonel and proving my bravery by leading a charge over Redoubt No. 10 at the victorious Battle of Yorktown. By the time of the end of the revolution, I had thus positioned myself for greater things. But my life's trajectory could not have sprung from more desperate origins. I was born in obscurity and hardship. My father absconded with himself post haste. My mother died when I was but a child. My inheritance was stolen. My cousin and protector took his own life. My aunt, uncle, and grandmother died. Then, I turned 14. <laughs> with no guardian to provide for me, I was forced to take my sustenance completely into my own hands. A hurricane promptly destroyed the town in which I lived. Instead of wallowing in despondency, I set out for America at the age of about 16. Through risk and relentless application, I availed myself of the copious opportunities offered by my new country. I rose to the rank of the first Secretary of the Treasury of these United States. My task, as I saw it, was to place the commerce and finance of the U.S. on strong footing. Now, at this point, as with so many times in my life previously, I was presented with many insufferable obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, it appears Mr. Jefferson has arrived. Good day, sir. Now, I actually think that Mr. Jefferson's presence might be beneficial in order to illustrate some of the obstacles I had to overcome in establishing the First Bank of the United States. Uh, would you mind sharing some of your thoughts, sir? Oh, certainly, Mr. Hamilton. It, it must be completely eradicated. Now, you are being unreasonable. If left uninterrupted, it will wreak havoc on all of the farmers throughout the United States ere long. No, quite, the, quite the contrary, it will help them. Help them? Since its first ravages were noted on Long Island in 1777, it has spread across New Jersey and is now poised to invade Pennsylvania, laying waste to swaths of wheat crop wherever it migrates. What are you talking about? Why, the Hessian fly, of course. The what? The body mage, the wheat fly, mere Toyota destructor. Why are you talking about the Hessian fly? Well, you asked me to share my thoughts. I was thinking about the <laughs> I, was not, I was not asking you to share your thoughts on insects. I was asking you to share your thoughts on the topic at hand. Which is? The First Bank of the United States. Ah, that. Mm -hmm. Are you certain you would not rather discuss entomology? No, I thank you, but I'm quite certain. Very well, then. A national bank. It must be completely eradicated. Now what? If left uninterrupted, it will wreak havoc on all the farmers throughout the United States. Quite Europe. the contrary, it will help them. Help them? Your banking system, with its stock jobbing and gambling, is teaching Americans to believe that ledger domain tricks on paper can produce as solid wealth as hard labor in the earth. The hard labor of the farmers has had its yield repeatedly injured by rampant currency depreciation caused by the lack of a regulating influence. My banking system will regulate it. Your regulation puts a disproportionate amount of influence over national economy into the hands of a secret few bankers and men of business who themselves are not regulated by the voice of the American people. What? The farmers are at the mercy of the masters of commerce. I, I'm sorry, uh, but a uh, slave owner using the word master is a disparaging epithet. Oh. It's rich with irony. Slavery is not on the table for discussion today. Yeah, it never is. <laughs> Your system harms more than just farmers. Many of the poor soldiers who sacrificed so much in our revolution were insufficiently informed 
that their debts owed to them by the United States were soon going to be repaid in full. But your Hamiltonopolis friends, in full command of this esoteric knowledge, used it to cheat our heroes out of what they were owed. Hamiltonopolis. New York City. I like it. <laughs> it was not meant as a compliment. I know. Isolated abuses cannot be used to define an entire system. Furthermore, abuses are more likely to happen on a local level than on a national. It is a known fact in human nature that its affections are commonly weak in proportion to the distance or diffusiveness of the object. Concealed influence and private greed are woven throughout your system. Of course they define it. Unscrupulous men like your good friend William Dewar manipulate the castles in the air that you call bonds to create bubbles which will inevitably burst the livelihoods of countless Americans of limited means. The damage has hardly been limited to a local level. The good produced by my system outweighs the risk. It will help the very farmers and soldiers you wish to protect now, by gathering all of the state debts into one and funneling them through a single national bank, the states can negotiate as a group and get better rates individually. Well, the states will repeatedly meet the same fate as did Massachusetts in 1786. Standing alone in the face of its debt, the state levied severe taxes on farmers, many of whom had risked their very lives in order to help us win independence. That is what sparked Shea's rebellion. My national bank and funding system will help prevent future Shays like rebellions. I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. Not when it can be so easily avoided. Easily avoided by ignoring the Constitution. The Constitution grants Congress the power to regulate commerce. To erect a bank and to regulate commerce are two very different acts. He who erects a bank creates a subject of commerce in its bills. A bank may be convenient, but it is certainly not necessary. No man placed in the office of Secretary of the Treasury for even a single month could maintain the slightest doubt that banks are essential to the pecuniary operations of the government. There you are, hiding behind your necessary and proper clause again. It is not denied that there are implied as well as expressed rights, and that the former are as effectually delegated as the latter. I hope that the foundation of the Constitution is laid upon this ground, that all powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. To take a single step beyond the boundaries thus specially drawn around the powers of the government is to lay hold of a boundless field of power no longer susceptible of any definition. The very definition of government and every step the United States must take says that you are wrong. Every power granted to a government includes a right to employ all the means requisite and fairly applicable to the attainment of the ends of such a power. If we do as you say, we would be a people governed without a government. Well, though it is impossible for me to express just how much I would enjoy remaining here, descended into the pit like a gladiator with you, I'm afraid that I am nearly late for a discussion at the American Philosophical Society. Oh, indeed. What are you discussing? Why, the Hessian fly, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry I asked. As am I, sir. Good day. Good day, sir. I have been falsely represented as seeking contention at all terms. My detractors have accused me of wishing to subvert this Constitution by establishing the dominance of one region or interest above the rest. On the contrary, it is the first wish of my heart that the Union may last. The, the systems that I have proposed are no more perfect than the hand of man can devise. Yet, if mankind were to resolve to agree in no institution until every part of it had been adjusted to the most exact standard of perfection, society would soon become a general scene of anarchy and the world a desert. We have fought side by side to make America free. Let us hand in hand struggle to make her happy. Thank you, my fellow Americans. Now, uh, if you will excuse me, I also have a pressing appointment, but unlike that of Mr. Jefferson's, mine is of great import. <laughs>